Awesome. Thank you so much. So I think, um, yeah, as a, as I said, I'm a GD in Angular for the past three years. I've been in the software industry for uh, for about uh, nine years now. Uh, and I'm originally, or I'm, I'm more of a front-end focused full stack engineer. Um, right now working as a software architect uh, on some design systems, some UX challenges. And it's uh, really interesting for us to be able to be confident about our uh, our products whenever it comes to shipping to, we have, we have a lot of customers and we have hundreds and thousands of users using the products every day. So it's a, it's really interesting to share um, what we think is is essentially you know uh, the way to go when we talk about confidence and robustness within the applications. So without further ado, I'm actually going to start sharing my screen and we are going to get into the talk right now. So let's do it. Awesome. So I hope everyone is able to see my screen. I'm gonna quickly open the chat as well so I can see whenever someone types something uh, because I don't see everyone right now. But in any case, let's get started. And I hope you're seeing my slides. So just someone say, yes, we see it. And then we are good to go. Great. So this whole presentation is all about getting started with end-to-end -end testing using Cypress. And Cypress is an amazing tool. It is one of the few things that I have loved since the beginning of my career. I mean, I have had many things like jQuery, <laughs> Um, after that, Angular, uh, there, there have been multiple things that came into our world, like Webpack, um, Module Federation. It's, there are a lot of things. Cypress is one of those things that I was really excited about, uh, especially when I started using it. And we are going to have a look into that pretty soon. If you want to reach out to me, you can just search the word code with SN and you will find me on almost every social platform. So feel free to connect. I usually reply within 24 hours. At least I try to. Great, so let's talk about what is Cypress. You might know some stuff about that already, but I'm gonna try to at least share something new today. So Cypress is an open source test runner that you can use for testing your web applications, whether you're, whether you're testing your application locally or you're testing your application remotely. For example, if they're deployed, even that doesn't matter, you can directly run tests against a deployed application as well. Now, when we talk about Cypress, what, um, it helps you with is it helps you setting up the test so it gives you a complete framework for or the tooling to set up those things because it kind of comes up with chrome uh, or chromium engine as a bundler that you can run the test on it supports multiple browser and we are going to see them as well but in general it provides you the ease of configuration as i said you could run tests tests are across or against a local app also or on a deployed application. So it really depends. And then finally, it also gives you something to run the test and visualize those things. It also helps you with recording tests, which is amazing because <clears throat> imagine being a QA in a team um, and you see there are certain bugs coming up. All you need to do is that you need to now pick this recording against that failed test case and send it to your development team. And they should be able to see the video, what happened, and get a good idea of what is happening there. So it really makes it easy for the videos, as well as it has also some snapshots uh, testing or images that you can also share when running those tests. So it's really easy to configure as well. And finally, for the developers, absolutely loving this, the debugging part. It makes it so easy to debug the steps of your test that you can easily find out the issues in whatever step was failing. Imagine sending an API call, getting some results, and trying to append that data into the UI. You could actually see where things went wrong. You could see what API call was done, what was the data that came back, and now if anything was appended to the UI or not. We're going to see that in a bit. So what sets Cypress apart from the other test runners? First of all, it has really good support. Now this image is a bit older, as you can see, it shows Chrome 80. This one is a new one, but you can go to cypress.io and you can see that it essentially supports the major modern browsers that you can run the tests against for your products, essentially. It also supports Edge, as you can see, also Electron. Now, if you talk about the big or major features about Cypress, these would be the following ones. 
we have a time travel feature, which essentially um, builds in a way that when you run Cypress tests, along with running the test, Cypress also takes snapshots of your test as they go along. So you can always go back to them, as I said, and see how each step looked. So you can see those, you can click on those steps and also see further information in something that we call command log or the console. So it shows you what data was retrieved from the API or what happened when this particular step was done. We're going to look into it in a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. It also supports real-time reloads, which means that, <clears throat> sorry, which means that if you are, um, changing your code if you're working and developing right now and you need to change something on the go for a local locally deployed app of course it automatically reloads the test so you don't have to you know spin up everything again and build or obviously you would be running a hot reload or something but you don't have to rerun cypress from scratch it doesn't take a lot of time as soon as you change something within the source code it automatically uh, runs the uh, the sorry it runs the test against those things. Now, when we talk about debuggability, as I said, you can easily see in the time travel debugger how it works. But also, we have further commands that you could use for debugging. For example, if you're familiar with web development, you might have seen this keyword called debugger that you can put in your JavaScript, and then the browser automatically stops there. Similarly. Cypress also provides such debugging tools. We are going to look into it. And also one of the coolest features of Cypress is also to wait for a particular thing to happen. Now you could talk about waiting for a UI element to appear, or you could also talk about waiting for an API call to finish. We're going to look into it in a bit as well. Now, when we talk about time travel, this is how essentially it looks. Now, this is a test that we have in one of our uh, applications that uh, that I have created for the demo. But imagine that we have a really simple application that we want to test. And the use case is that when we add a new item or when we add a new message to a chat, it should be added to the messages list. Now, this is the test. Now, when we run this test, Cypress essentially allows us to go back into different steps. As you can see on the left, we have this sort of command log or the steps that you could go mouse over over any, anything. And if relevant on the right side, you see what was the state at that time in this whole test scenario. You could see how the UI looked before we added a new chat message and after when the item was added to the list. So you can see that on the right side, and this is pretty cool. Now, when we talk about debugging capabilities, as I mentioned, that apart from just going through this time travel thing from the snapshots, you could add this debugger keyword into your code. And we're going to look at the code in a bit as well. But imagine putting this debugger at the right places where you have or where you think the issue might be and directly reaching that space without having to go through all of the steps. So it makes development so much easy. You can use the debugger keyword in that case. And when you do, as you can see here, Cypress automatically stops at that debugger. And then another way of doing this is using the debug method alongside these commands. So here, what you see right now is that cy.title should, it is essentially taking this debug method and applying it to the very adjacent command, which is this should command. And this is really handy because it sort of does the same thing. But instead of just putting debug everywhere, this kind of binds itself to the command that you want to debug. And in this case, you would see something like this. It would still have this debugger being applied, but around the command. But in this moment, if you use this debug method, it does something else. It essentially logs that particular thing onto the console. So here you can see that what was the command? It was should. What was the command arguments? It was this, that we are testing something to be equal to ng Cypress starter. And what is the current value of this? You can see that that is the value that we have right now. So this is how you would essentially debug this with the debugger method and some other stuff as well. Now, another amazing debugging capability is that, as I said, you can quickly go to the left, uh, left steps and kind of click those steps and see the output of those things, not just the right side snapshot that you see, but also the output. For example, here you can see that we can see which were the messages. Now in this test case, what we have as a situation is that we are asserting that, hey, initially there were, for example, uh, 
four messages as I can see. So we had four messages in the chat before we added a new item and then they became five. So as we click through those steps, you can actually see that it tests how many items were there. You can see five items right now in this list. And it also shows you initially it was four. And when we typed that via test cases into our input, you can see which of the keywords were fired in that place. So you can actually see, hey, if I typed in the input correctly, according to my assumption, or was it wrong? So it's, it's really good in terms of debuggability. Now let's talk about something else. How do you get started with Cypress? So you need to do is you need to npm install this package within your project. If you are working with an Angular project, it would be the same situation. If you're working on a web project, it would essentially be the same because Cypress is not bound to Angular. You can use it with React, Vue.js or whatever. Essentially, what I try to do is I use these two packages to run the application and Cypress instance simultaneously at the same time. So once you do so, you can quickly add these two commands into your package JSON for your project. And then all you need to do is just run the Cypress test command and it starts the application as well as the Cypress. So you might have to do some magic right here in the Cypress test command to see how you start your application and how you run the Cypress open command. Now, once you are set up, you need to run the Cypress test command as it runs both of the things, the app as well as the Cypress test. And then you will notice something. And that is that you will see this Cypress project or Cypress folder within your project and this Cypress JSON. Now, if you're working with Cypress for the first time, this is what it does. It essentially just adds a couple of examples for you. So you can see how to wait for an API call, how to write certain tests. So you can see all of those really good examples to uh, maybe take an inspiration in the beginning. And then the Cypress JSON file is really interesting. This is what holds that when you run the test, what would be the viewport of this Cypress runner that we are trying to run? If we needed to ignore any files, you could mention it here, but more importantly, the base URL. Now this becomes very handy because here you can specify that my app is running on localhost 4200, but you can easily uh, change this into your CI CD and then point to, let's say your staging environment or your production environment. So you don't have to change anything into Cypress code because these things can be used as an ENV variable within the Cypress test. So this is really easy to handle. Now let's talk about some of the Cypress commands and assertions. How do we, uh, how do we do certain things in Cypress? So first of all, whenever a particular test starts, imagine that each particular test or each spec runs in isolation. And usually the way to do this is that you have uh, either it by feature or by page, but in any case, Whenever a test runs, it has to go to a certain page. So Cypress know what, what's happening because what Cypress does is that it just opens a browser in the beginning. Now you need to tell Cypress to go to localhost 4200 slash. And here you can see that I'm not specifying HTTP localhost 4200 because I've already spe specified that in the Cypress JSON. So all I need to say here is a slash or I could say slash login if I wanted to go to login page. So we need to go to the home page in this particular situation. And then we are asserting this test that, hey, this title that we have, um, it should be equal to blah, blah, blah. And in Angular, if you're using the hash strategy and if we have a page like this, this is what I would do. I would just give this the URL and then I'm asserting certain things. Now, one more thing that you would want to do is um, if you want to get a particular HTML element, you can use the CSS selectors for this. For example, here you can see that we are doing cy.get hash, and then whatever your ID is. You could also use, um, for example, classes or items with attribute, go crazy and, and use any sort of CSS selected that you want. One other way of finding a particular item is using by text. Now you have to be very careful when using this because this one says, hey, get any item that has the word delete in it. Now, if you have even, let's say a P tag or an H1 or a heading, that has the phrase, do you want to delete this? And it has the same case as this one. Cypress will get that as well because this works as a regex. So you have to be careful when using this. This is not something that checks the entirety of the text content, but rather works as a regex. So we are going to look into some of the use cases. 
Before we start working on the first use case, I would just like to show you the app that we have right now so we can have a quick look at that. So I'm gonna to go to Localos 4200 and show you the application. It's very simple application. All it has is just this UI where we have certain messages. I could go here, type something, hit enter, and you can see that it gets added to this list at the very bottom, something like this. And what happens is that if I go and hover over it, any item, I can click this item to delete it. Another thing that I can do right here is that I could go to a particular uh, message by just clicking here and you can see that this goes to a detail page now. And I can now delete this message as well. And when I delete a particular message, I go back to the home page and see this message removed. For example, we know that right now there were three messages, but if I delete this and go back, now we have two. I could do the same thing and now we have only one message. So these are the tests that we are going to look into uh, in, in the coming examples. So moving from there, the first test case that we are looking at is we need to click the fourth item and then we just have to check that if we go to that particular page detail. And the way to check this is that we need to perform the action and then assert the URL that we have. So the way to do this is this. We have a test switch here that we call, hey, it should navigate to the message page on the list message item click. Then we start doing the magic. We say that, hey, get the message list and the message item. So via this, what we're trying to do is that we are getting all the messages or message items or the chat items. And then we are using the EQ3, which essentially gets the fourth item because EQ starts with zero. So what we are trying to do is that we are saying, hey, get all the messages, then pick the fourth one and then click on it. Afterwards, check the URL. So by CY URL, we check what is the URL right now. And then we assert that it should equal to HTTPS localhost 4200 message and three. Now here you can see that uh, we are using HTTP localhost, but Asen just said that you don't have to use that in the code because we are using it in Cypress JSON. Well, you could get the env variable here and replace it with this one. Uh, I forgot to do so. So uh, you understand the concept here. Now, after doing this, it essentially passes for us and you can see the snapshot right here, what steps we're taking. This is step started. Then before each actually took us to that particular page on slash, then we got the message item list. We picked the third item and I'm actually going to just open my this so you can see it is highlighted. Cool. So we essentially pick the fourth item and then here we click that. Once we click that, you see this new URL here from Cypress, which tells us that the URL was changed. And now we are asserting the same thing. We are testing that, hey, this should equal to message slash three, which means that our test is passing. Similarly, if we go forward in this one, let's, let's talk about another test use case. We need to click the fourth item. We need to uh, click the delete button. And then we essentially need to check if we navigate it back. So here is the test. We click the fourth item. We go to the detail page, but now we also want to delete it, go back to see that item deleted. And the way to test this would be, hey, initially we had four items. We went to that items detail, we deleted it, we came back to the page, and now we should have three items. So that is how you would map this test. And this is what we do. Instead of doing it from the scratch, we could in the test already assume that we are on the page or on the third page. This is another way of doing this if you're bringing it via pages. So in this case, we start with the detail page, then, we try to get this delete button, right? And we know how to get this because if we see this div here, you can see that we have got this class card and then we have a button inside. So this would be one way of getting it or you could get it by a cy.contain method. But essentially here is what we do. We do the same thing. We say, hey, get the div, which has the class card, which is this one. And inside here, we got this button. So here we are saying, hey, get this card, and then get any item inside that card that has this word delete because we are not searching this delete globally. As I said, it's regex. When we get that button, we click this. Then we assume that, hey, now, if we click that delete button, the URL should have been changed to this, localhost 4200 chat. And we also need to confirm that now the messages are three before it, there were four messages. Now you could also assert this in the beginning that, hey, do we have four messages or not? But in the end, this is how it would look. So you can see the steps taken here. We started with the detail page and afterwards we got this card element. Then we found the delete button. 
Then we clicked on it. The URL changed automatically. So this is coming from Cypress. And then we assert that, hey, now we should be at this page, which is the chat page. And we also assert that now the items should be three. And this is why it works automatically. Now consider another use case. In this one, we want to see that a new message was added to the list. So in this case, we click this input, we type something automatically, and then we click this button so that item gets added. And now uh, the, the mapping would be exactly the same. We are asserting initially that, hey, this page should have four message items. So we are checking here that the length is four. We are, of course, getting it from the CSS, and then we are applying some code here. But afterwards, we get the chat input via CSS selectors. We type this message inside, and then we get the send button, and then we click. Now, you will notice here is that we are doing this dot chaining here, which is really good sometimes. But you have to be very careful when you work with it um, a bit more. You will find that in some cases, it doesn't really work. But essentially, in most cases, you can chain the CY command. So here, we get the input, we type. Uh, in that input, the hello world. Then we do another cy.get, which is a short form here. And then we click this button. Once we do so, we are asserting that now instead of four, we should have the five messages. Now, this is just for explanation that we are checking, hey, are there four messages? Are there five messages? But a better test would be to actually see the content of that fifth message. So we should be very precise with our test that, hey, I added hello world is the fifth item on the view right now is hello world actually. And that would be a better test, but that's just a bonus tip to say. So when we do this, this is how it looks. We start on the home page, we check the four items, we get the item type, click the button, and then we see that we should have the five um, messages here. Now, some of you would be like, um, okay, <laughs> this seems very simple, very basic code. Um, it's uh, something that I already know. Tell me something new. So what is in this talk that is for the experienced folks with testing we're going to cover some complex cases now so consider this case now what we need to do is that we need to hover over the third item delete that within the home page and assert that now we have two messages in the list or one less message if i open the app this is essentially this use case where i have to mouse over and then click this delete button. And then I'm seeing that, hey, now we should have one message less. So how can we do this in Cypress in this case? So I'm gonna let this open and render, cool. Now, in this particular case that we just discussed, this is how, it, the, how you would imagine it. Similar use case, we have, we got four items in the beginning, we are good. Then we go and mouse over, let's say this, the third item, and then we find the delete button within that and then we click on it. So we already know that we have got some list items and we have the delete button inside that list item. So that's what we are doing here. But if we run this, the magical thing is that <clears throat> this will fail. And the reason for failing is that when it goes and tries to find this delete button, as you can see, it fails because you cannot see the delete button. It may or may not exist on the view. And so Cypress cannot find it. Now, one thing that is really interesting is that Cypress, when failing, automatically waits for about four seconds to do something before it says, no, this is not working. So how do we fix that? And question is why it doesn't work. Uh, and as I mentioned, Cypress has no way of identifying, you know, how to perform over or this hover thing. So in this case, if I talk about the solution here, this is the solution. And it's most likely the solution to most of the things that we know using the force. Um, we have this really nice parameters inside this click method that we can provide. And it's called force. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly change my camera's battery because I think you all see a blank screen now. Just give me one second. There we go. You should be able to see me now. So now when we talk about this force attribute, this essentially tells Cypress to also see hidden elements, not just the ones that are visible right now. And when we do so, we do it like this. We are saying that, hey, get the third message find the delete button within and then click it with the force 
even if it's not visible. When we do so, you will see that the test now passes. And you can see that if we go to these steps, we actually see that item right here. On the right side, you will notice that we see that item because Cypress also shows that. And when we click, it shows this really nice red dot. So you can see it being appearing here. And that is awesome. Now let's talk about some complex cases, testing forms. So in this particular case, we are talking about this login scenario. Now we are talking about real stuff. So let's suppose we got this uh, login form in which we needed to uh, provide an input into the email, provide an input into the password, and then also submit the form. But you might also want to see what happens if we don't provide a password or email, and does it show the errors that it is supposed to? Here, you could write those tests. You could assert multiple situations within this in Cypress very easily. Another complex case is waiting for the XHR calls. And this is very important because you might depend on a particular situation where you need to call an API to get something and you need to do something in response for that. So not everything is just you know, putting UI elements here and there. A lot of things really require the API calls. So Cypress actually allows us to do something about it. For example, in this case, what you see is that I have typed something in the input and I tested that, hey, now I should have, as soon as I type it, it should show me the first user, which is Irene or uh, Irene Neo. I, I don't know how to pronounce this name. But the thing is that as soon as Cypress starts or goes to that code, Cypress assumes that this is already there. But the thing is that here you can see that the data comes later or the API call might be delayed, or let's say the network is poor, or the server is not responding, and this fails because by the time this test step was reached by Cypress, we didn't even have the API call responding the data, therefore there is no change on the UI. So how do we tell Cypress to wait for an API call, even if it doesn't matter you know, how, how much time it takes? So this is the error that we get, uh, and you can see that here we were expecting this, um, this data change and that didn't happen. Now, if I see this here, and actually just to reflect there, the test that I wrote was we that we should assert that we have only one item in the UI after the test. In the beginning, we have 10, but after searching, we should only have one, and that fails right now. Now, the test looks something like this, and when we talk about aliases, they work in this particular way. You can essentially have a particular text value wrapped as an alias. You can also see that in the code forward. For example, here is how you define an alias. And you could call an alias like a label or like a mark, for example. So here I call it my alias. And in the later state, I can go ahead and just say that, hey, my alias should equal this particular value and this test would pass. But if I have another test suite in which I'm trying to uh, choose this alias as well, the thing is that this will not pass. The alias has a scope of only the test suite, or it depends on where you're defining it. If you're defining an alias within a particular test suite, it will only be available in that test suite, but not the other one. So the right way of doing this is that you define the aliases, if possible, of course, inside the before each method. And when you do so, and when you do this as my alias, this essentially makes this available for every test suite because this was declared before you. So just some tip uh, for when you get into this particular issue. Now let's get back to the problem here. We were waiting for the API call and how do we fix that? So in the before each context, when you visit the particular page, what you could do is that you could intercept an HTTP call. You could either provide the complete URL or you could also use a wildcard. Now, in my case, I need to be able to use this with the search query and I could search anything and I'm sending the data uh, into this URL query parameter. So I could search any name. That's why I'm using this wildcard entry here. And I'm kind of aliasing that as search users. Now, when I do this, I can actually in later stage of my test, I could say that, hey, I'm now trying to get this input or the search input that we saw before I'm going to type the word iron inside, then I need to wait for this HTTP call to finish. And Cypress will not execute this further code until we get the data back. So after we get this API call done, then 
you see that we are asserting something. Now, the fun part is that you would make sure that we are waiting for this, but in some cases, you also have other ways to extend this time, but that's not really optimum because you could say, hey, wait for like 10 seconds, but that is not optimal. But this wait strategy, this is really good. Now see what happens. As soon as I search something, it waits. Now it's waiting. And then the HTTP call happens. And you see that now the test passes. And that is because the data came. And then instead of 10 cards, the app itself, based on the API call, showed one data. And everything looks good. Another complex thing that comes into Cypress is using fixtures. Now imagine that you depend on API calls for all of your tests, which is mostly going to be the case. And you're dependent on, for example, some third-party API as well. Now, most of the third parties basically charge you in terms of API calls. And if you run tests, for example, every deployment, it's going to cost you a fortune, right? So instead of making this really real API calls, you could use dummy API call responses. And this is not just true for third-party APIs, but also for your APIs. You may not want to run against real data into your tests. And with this, there is even a possibility of running this on production or running your tests on production because you are going to be working with fixtures or mock data all along. You're not going to be interacting with the API calls for production, the real API calls per se. So here is an example that we are talking about. At the moment, what we do is that we are getting the data in this particular situation from, uh, from the real API. But here you can see that we got all of this data. And the way to do this would be, you need to understand what is the API response, and then you need to mock the data according to the response that your app expects, of course, otherwise it wouldn't work. So without Cypress uh, fixtures, you, you do this particular situation where we have aliases, but if you use fixtures, then something changes. So here, what I've done is that I've created a user JSON inside this fixtures uh, path, and this is where you should have all your fixture declared. You just create JSON files here according to the response your API call expects. And you can see here that we have the same sort of response. The only difference here is this. You see that we got info here and results, but in my mock, I don't have info. I just have results and I have this new property called fixture version. This is just something for me to maintain the version if I update anything later on. But this results is something that my app expects. And this is what I'm providing from here. You can see that here we have got users.json that we created. And now what I can do is that in the before each case, what I do is that first of all, even before visiting the page, because my app starts loading the user as soon as you go to the page. How do I tell Cypress to stop, not do that, or stop before I can identify or register my fixture? So here is where I'm registering my fixture. Before any test starts, first, I get this fixture from my, uh, from my code. This is user.json. Then I essentially use that fixture, which is right now the response variable here. And I essentially say, hey, intercept every call that the Cypress test is going to make to this particular wildcard, and then use this response as a fixture. So we are still intercepting the call. We are using the alias, but instead of just using a real call, we intercept and stop it and use the response. So this call never goes to my backend or your third-party API, whatever you're using. And once we are done with this, we can essentially use this against the test. The rest of the steps are exactly the same. Just by putting this fixture thing here, the rest of the code looks exactly the same, which is really good because we can now test with everything that we talked about. And now I'm just going to throw a really quick shameless plug. Um, some of the examples that I've used, or actually every example that I've used here is essentially from this Angular cookbook, which I can probably uh, bring on the screen as well. So you can see this in reality. This is how the Angular cookbook looks. Uh, it's pretty thick, uh, which means it uh, took a lot of time for me to write. And we launched this in, um, in August last year. It has more than 600 pages. It has more than 80 recipes. This uh, screenshot is an old one. It has more than 80 recipes. And we just talked about like six to seven recipes uh, about Cypress only. But that book has a lot of things, animations, progressive web apps, uh, component communication, state management, uh, performance optimizations in Angular and whatnot. So feel free to check it out. 
Um, and in the end, I would like to say two things. One, test your apps before your users. Um, that's probably the smartest thing to do. Um, and second, if you like snowboarding, I would suggest not to take your dog to there because you might end up in a situation like this, which we may laugh at or not at all. Thank you. And now I can answer any questions. Yeah, wow. That was that was a lot of great content. I mean, I, I just I just love all the examples and animations. Like tell you, you put a lot of work into it. So so thank you so much, SM, for, for sharing um, everything with us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we, we have a, well, we already got a good amount of questions in the Q&A box. But yeah, like now it's time for questions. Um, we'll get through as, as many of them as possible. Um, it's, it's not too late. You can still type in the, in the Q&A box on the bottom. So let me just start from the top and see what we got. Um, and apologize in advance if I pronounce your name wrong. All right, um, Shweta. And asked, uh, can we get elements under Shadow DOM in iframes using Cypress? That's a really good question. Uh, and I don't have the answer to that yet, but I can definitely look into it and uh, maybe tweet it. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Okay, next, um, Eric asks, is there any possible way Cypress would do code injection on a live Shopify site doing testing on a local instance without making any pushes to a repo? It's something we have a problem with. It has been occurring for two weeks. It's a certain problem, yeah. So the thing is that if I want, I can write some Cypress code right now and I can even go and test Google because all we need to do is to give this a URL that, hey, go to this page, pick this input and do anything. It doesn't see my code when I'm running tests against it. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, and the answer to the question is yes. You don't have to push your Cypress code to anywhere. Or if you, even if you have a local uh, host code that you have, it doesn't really matter. If you have something in deployment, a live running site, you can essentially run Cypress separately and then Cypress, and you can code obviously Cypress to perform actions on that side. That's completely possible. Okay. And there just commented the lecture info. My code is being displayed as an overlay on my site. The actual Cypress code is shown. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let me go to the next one. Uh, Felicia said, how can I test multiple viewports? It seems like Cypress uh, JSON only sets a single form factor. When you say multiple viewports, what do we mean about that? Do you mean that we have a single app with multiple things or I'm, I'm trying it tough to understand uh, what do we mean by multiple viewports? Okay. Yeah, Felicia, if you're here, uh, feel free to type in the chat or comment in the Q&A. Um, yeah, um, yeah, just wait a couple of seconds, but if not, we can, we can move on for now. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if she's still in the in the crowd. Okay, let's let's move on. Um, but Felicia, feel free to type in the chat. Uh, if you definitely if you're able. Um, Shweta again asked, um, do we have limitations using Safari browser and cross domain on Cypress? Um, I don't really think so. So we do have. I mean, Safari is a bit to test, but I don't think there's any limitation at this point. I actually have to check if Cypress supports Safari. But if it does, I don't think there's going to, going to be any limitations. But okay. uh, you have to know that Cypress only tests one browser at a time. So if you want to run multiple tests, you would have to run uh, multiple instances. It doesn't support Safari? Yeah, I thought so. I think in the latest one, they're supporting Edge. Uh, they're supporting um, Electron, Chrome, and anything with the Chromium engine. Safari is always a pain. <laughs> Oh, so I, I find it funny that um, that this person named Cypress Noob is is answering a lot of questions about. Has Cypress. so much knowledge, yes. <laughs> it's a very very humble person. Okay, oh Felicia. Okay, I just I just saw the the comments on on the so you know regarding the viewport question, she was saying uh, no, it's it's phone plus desktop and no phone and other form factors like desktop. Ah yeah. uh, no, I think Cypress only works with web apps. 
at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I we'll know see. that um, I can't recall the name of the app, browser something, browser stack. I think that supports a lot of browsers and a lot of mobile apps as well. So you might want to look into browser stack for, for a bigger enterprise solution. Uh, okay, so Felicia's different question. Uh, can you pick the last item in the list regarding how long it is? Sorry, could you repeat again? Yeah, so can you know? I, I assume she's asking about like you know when we select different different items in the list. Uh, so you can you know pick specifically the last item in the list. Does and regardless of how long the list is. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's a. Uh, I I'm not sure if the EQ takes a minus one. But I would imagine that would be the way to go uh, to say it's the last item. Or you could, um, when we when we take the items, um, there are two ways when we run a Cypress command. One is we just write the command. Other other is that we use the then value or the then method to get the contents of those items, and then we run command. So if you just say cy dot get this uh, the message for example, it would get all the messages in that case. Uh, but if you say dot then, and then you also get the value out of it, then it kind of returns the DOM nodes or the DOM list. That's where you get the length of those selection that you have got. And now you can just use that, for example. So you could say something like, hey, cy dot get my selector, and then the length minus one, and you get the last item. So there are two ways to do this. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, just keep going. Oh, well, yeah. Questions keep coming in. This is great. <laughs> yes. uh, so, so Wilson is a little bit longer. So he asks, do you know someone who has used Cypress to create a script to automate the creation of demo videos? Is it practical for a demo to be defined in Cypress script rather than the usual Word slash Excel document of manual scripts? What recommendations do you have for sharing of scripts by testing and the demo video crew? And I think the next one is a clarification. A demo script would not have verification, but would have additional timings. Hmm, that's an interesting challenge. I know that you could tell in Cypress to record every step. So when you run a test, it essentially records the whole process. So for example, if you have a login module and you have this or, or you run the test, essentially, it would create those videos anyways, if that's what you're looking for. So imagine having 10 modules, 10 tests for those modules, and then you can have a video recording created for all of those. By default, I think Cypress records them even if you, even if the tests pass or fail, but you can also uh, say that, hey, don't record anything for the ones that are passing, uh, depends on the situation. But yes, I, I don't think you need to, write a particular script for doing that. If you just want the video for the whole flow, you just need to write those tests. Uh, if you want to do scripting, I, I don't think Cypress supports that at the moment. But what we have done, or I could, I could share that, we have worked on some sort of a smoke testing uh, flow that was essentially, but, but then we kind of, you could say we hacked around it or we, what we did was we just created one test file that went through different pages. So by default, Cypress is supposed to work page by page, every page in isolation that is, or it depends on the practice that your team uh, basically finalizes. But for smoke testing, we sort of uh, kind of, uh, what do you call it? We took it like a script or we pretended it's a script, but it was essentially just the series of steps for smoking, a smoke test. So maybe that answers the question to some extent. Okay. Uh, Felicia, that's a very important question that we all want to know. Is the dog okay? <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can only hope is the answer. Okay, Edo asked, a dot trigger mouse over or Yoda click? <laughs> yeah, you have to read the question then. Yeah. Would be click Yoda, I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, Axe, um, idea behind React testing library in Cypress seems a bit similar. So can we replace unit tests with Cypress end-to-end -end testing? That's an interesting question. I think unit tests and end-to-end -end tests, they both, 
I want to say they're very different, but the thing is that at some point they kind of come very close together and there's a very thin line when you need to differentiate between those two. Um, and it then depends from team to team. I would say Cypress um, is not intended for unit testing, at least what I've shown so far. But Cypress is working on something that is meant for unit testing. So if you go to cypress.io, you can see component testing that they are working on. I think a couple of uh, weeks ago, it was still in the preview mode or maybe a month ago, uh, but they might be progressing with it. So you could replace React testing library with that particular module, which is the component testing. Cypress new or Cypress not so new, but <laughs> Cypress test I for, oh, okay. I, I see there's another, um, uh, they asked another question down there. So I think this is the full one. So the question is, can Cypress test content in iframes? If so, is a plugin necessary? Um, I have seen a plugin for iframes. I never got to test one, uh, but I think Cypress itself has a really nice article as far as I can remember about testing iframes. So it is possible because they are, I mean, there's a blog from Cypress about this. So I imagine it's quite possible. Uh, you may or may not use the, I, uh, the iframe package for that one, but I know there's a Cy Cypress iframe package for sure. All right, awesome. Uh, oh, this, uh, I think this might be uh, from the previous question that Felicia asked. I'm thinking of how I can test model form factors using Puppeteer. Uh, I, yeah, do you have anything to add to that? I think we already answered the question earlier. It would be too early for me to say anything about Puppeteer. I do want to use it. Uh, I don't have any experience at the moment with Puppeteer, um, but I'm definitely going to write it down. Right. Yeah, I'll wait until he finishes. Mm -hmm. All right, getting through that. Okay, Victor, as I have a project using snapshots. I need to test every component individually. Mm. Yeah. I think, so it, it really depends uh, again on the team's understanding. Um, what we try to do is that we at least have every critical flow end to end tested. For example, if you have a marketplace, you want to test that the user went through adding those items to the cart. That's, that's really important, but maybe as not important as doing some little things here and there. For example, if there was a tooltip shown or not, uh, if there was an ad shown or not, or little things like that. But you would want to make sure that the user was able to check out um, the, the items in the end, right? So those of the things I think they should be tested. It's not necessary to test everything. Uh, maybe start with the core components and then expand based on how critical things are. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it seems like he has a follow-up question. Uh, I don't know if you answered already. So in case of a player project, if I make a snapshot before the audio start, I need to test after the audio is started, the same element in, in, the, in the other test. I think that, yeah, it's more specific. I don't see that question. Where is that question? So it's the, it's the second from the top. Like, I think, I think it's, there's a little. Oh, now I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah okay. he has extra. So in extra case details. of a player project, if I make a snapshot before the audio start, Need to test after the audio. Hmm. No, I think you could test it in the first uh, in the first test. I don't think so. So in case of a player project, yeah, actually you're right. You're right. When you're running in this manner, when you need to take a snapshot before something, you would have to do that. Yes. But again, I, I think it really depends. When you talk about snapshot, are, you, are we talking about certain or just the images or the video that we talked about? Because if you're talking about video, as I said, if you have a file that runs multiple tests, it would create the video for all, all of the tests together. So you can then you know, differentiate between them. Uh, but if we are just talking about the images, I think it does it after each step. So you could have one test doing everything. You, you wouldn't need two tests in that case. All right. Oh, wow, we actually get into all of those. I wasn't sure we were gonna make it. Amazing. Um, Harry asked, is it possible to test a third-party authentication library integration on Cypress, for example, off 
zero. Yes. By default, when you would perform actions in in the app via Cypress, it would essentially do everything that a user would do. So by default, let's say if you have uh, the auth zero library being used within your code, I mean, Cypress doesn't know if you're using auth or not. It doesn't really matter to Cypress because it behaves like a user. So just like a user would go uh, type the inputs in in the form and then click the submit button, Cypress would do exactly the same. And by default, it's going to use the auth zero library. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. All right. Um, Zyda, um, can you factor and reuse pieces of test, for instance, login page? Um, so I imagine that to test in an area, I need to log it first, um, which is what I want to reuse for other tests. That's a really good question. We can use uh, we can use commands. So Cypress also allows you to add certain commands as global commands. For example, you could say something like cy.login, and that would run it whenever you call it from any of the tests. It, it really doesn't matter. So you can create reusable snippets right there. Yeah. Um, just one thing to add on top of that, I created a video on my YouTube channel about uh, this really nice tool called Cucumber. Um, could be a potential talk for us later, but if you want to see the video version, you could go to my YouTube and see that. Um, and Cucumber is sort of um, a tool that allows writing user stories in a really readable manner. For example, I could write in my code or repository something like, user enters um, input in the email input or user in uh, user fills the email input, user fills the password input, words like these. And my code actually can see those words, translate them into code and then run them. And the benefit of that would be exactly business driven development. So in, in the end, it would be something like that particular user stories file is a source of truth for the QAs to write in those, is a source of truth for the customer to see those user stories. And that directly binds with the code, with Cypress. So it's really possible to integrate all of those uh, cool things together. So I have a, a video in which I created a React application, wrote some Cypress tests, and then integrated or converted into Cucumber, which additionally, kind of reused or made the code reusable uh, even further. So uh, look into that as well. But yes, in particularly Cypress, we can also reuse the same code. All right. Boris, uh, is there a workaround for testing multiple tabs or windows? No, I think you could, I mean, it really depends. If you need to do it in a flow that the user clicks a button, then we open a new URL or new tab and we expect that, you know, th the point is how do we want to structure this? Because this was a challenge that we had to do it uh, ourselves as well. Um, but the, then the question is how, um, how would you do this? For example, we had this that the user would click a link and the link should be open in a new tab. Now Cypress doesn't have access to this tab and there's no workaround for that, but you could make your code in, in a way that it reflects um, that change, right? Now in unit testing, what you would do is that you would say, hey, the user clicked this button or this click, uh, click this link, did we call window.open in our code? That's one way to test it in terms of unit testing. How do you do this in, uh, in Cypress or E2E test? So what we did was we added a particular attribute to that link. And then we just asserted that, hey, if the user clicks this link and we were able to successfully open this into a new tab, we just add an attribute to that link that shows us that uh, this happened in real and there was no error in that. So there's no workaround for windows uh, or tabs, but you could be smart about how to test it. Okay. Uh, I think, yeah, let's take this last one also from Boris. Uh, is there a way to securely store the locking credentials? Yes. I mean, it would not be different than any other project. For example, you could, um, so you remember we talked about the Cypress JSON file, right? So that has, um, 
that is provided as an env variable to the cypress code or the context but cypress also uh, helps with um, certain environment variables so if you go to cypress.io and search for env variables you will find the documentation for that but essentially if you have a ci cd where you're running this you can basically provide them as the environment variables from the ci cd and cypress will pick them up if you're running them in any ci um, similarly if you are working with for example locally you could create an env file and then add those to the login credentials to those files or that file, not committing that to repository, of course, and then Cypress would pick it. So yeah, it would be similar to any, any other project, but the ENV variables are retrieved in Cypress in context. All right. Um, yeah, let's stop there for the question since we're about uh, at the time, but I think SN has the, now has the, the record of the most questions answered in one talk. <laughs> <laughs> over to 21 yeah this it's not going to be surpassed anytime soon i'm sure it's uh, it's amazing yeah thank you all for the questions thank you all for um just being being so engaged and um, paying so much attention to to this talk um yeah so if you have more questions um you know feel free to put on the the event page or if just reach out to to and like all, all of his um socials are, are on there that you can find it I uh, just want to make some quick announcements. Oh yeah, he already, he already put it in the chat. Perfect. Um, yeah, so the next event, I think it's is it happening next, this, I think it's happening next week. Um, there's going to be one about uh, PHP. I think uh, the speaker is going to build a Laravel app in 20 minutes. I think that's in the title, which is interesting. Um, yeah, so check it out if you want to, um, if, if you feel interested in that. And also there is going to be a, a Kind of not a conference, but an event series called the Developer Growth Summit that's happening next month in April. And we, we got some senior engineers and tech leaders from companies like Adobe, like Netflix, uh, Accenture. Um, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a great time of, of learning and growing. I'm gonna put all the links in the chat. Just one second. Let's so can all get that. All right, so you should all be able to see that. All right. Anyway, so that that's all I have for announcements. Um, as in, I just want to thank you again um, for for taking the time to share. And um, yeah, it's been it's been awesome. I think everyone's everyone really enjoyed it. And I want to ask if you have any um, any last thoughts or any encouragement that you want to leave with the audience before we end. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that I do share with my audience and my friends as well is, especially in the tech industry. Um, and that is mostly when you see someone who is, a, who is sharing some knowledgeable things, uh, we see usually the end product and not, not the failures that has happened. And I share this with everyone that most of the times, uh, whenever we see someone cool, uh, they don't have any idea what they are doing. <laughs> most of the people I know, they don't have any idea. I don't have an idea what I'm doing, but uh, it's good to uh, always reflect back on the things that you have done already than the things that you have not. Um, and kind of when we see someone who who is doing much better, because I idealize a lot of people, um, it's just good to not catch up on that and keep everything low and then share whatever you're working on. If you have little projects, um, share those. If you have small things that you're working on, share those as well. Uh, that's the best way to make connections. I mean, I didn't know that in at all. Uh, we met on Polywork, and I think I just started using it like, um, you know, out of no reason. <laughs> and uh, it's a great way to just share all those things. So yeah, that, that would be my thought of the day. <laughs>